Please join me, uh, welcome our speaker. Uh, hi everyone, I'm, I'm Owen Maud. Some of you may have met me around uh, during this week. Um, I'm here with the University of Sheffield. So I had a nice flight over on Sunday. Um, and today I'll be presenting to you a, my work for uh, my PhD, or one of the works that I've submitted to host, uh, privacy preserving protocol level approach to prevent machine learning modeling attacks on puffs in the presence of semi-honest verifiers. Uh, and I, I completed this work with some of my co-authors, um, Faye, Dr. Prasanta, who's uh, my supervisor, uh, August, Meltem, uh, Elif Kavan, some of you may know uh, Elif from, uh, from around the hardware security field, and uh, Bit Blap So just to go over a bit of uh, content, the, the overview of the talk I'm going to give. First, I'll cover some background uh, on, on Puffs, so a brief introduction um, to Puffs. Those of you who may have uh, visited Rolmai's tutorial uh, on Monday, you'll have a, you know, a really, he gave a brilliant introduction to Puffs, so you'll be well, uh, well up to date uh, on those, but I'll give an introduction to those who haven't um, heard of Puffs before. I'll then move on to the motivations for the research that we, we carried out for this protocol, um, and then I will introduce the uh, scenario of the semi-honest verifier for, uh, for which the protocol is based on. I'll then uh, cover the scheme that we proposed in this work, which consists of a, uh, a puff obfuscation design, so this is the hardware element that we worked on, um, and then the protocol design, which we, we tied into, into the hardware. Uh, and then I'll give some of the results and analysis on the machine learning resilience of the, the hardware design we implemented, um, and then the overhead for our F, the FBJ implementation, and then I'll, I'll give a conclusion. <coughs> so first of all, the important question is what is a, what is a puff, a physically uncloneable function? So we can think of a, a puff as an expression of an inherent and unclonable instance-specific feature of a physical, physical object, and in our case, uh, often an integrated circuit. Like any function, we can consider um, uh, takes an input, which we call a challenge, and gives a corresponding output, which is known as response. And these can be used in, um, in for, for secure applications and resource-constrained secure applications. And so these pairs of uh, challenges and the corresponding responses are known as challenge-response pairs. And uh, deterministically, we can generate responses from a given challenge. And we call these CRPs. I'll name them as CRPs throughout the rest of the talk. And so the security um, and thus the entropy uh, of a puff uh, is dependent on complex and variable, um, variable nature of physical material um, caused by manufacturing variation um, in, during the manufacturing process uh, of, of generating the puff chips. So there are a few key uh, important um, ways to uh, evaluate a puff, uh, around six in total, but the most important ones to denote a puff First being uniqueness, um, a puff needs to be unique, such that uh, for three different identically designed puffs, um, given the same challenge, we should, uh, they should exhibit different responses. Um, if they didn't, we couldn't use these to fingerprint or um, generate key, uh, unique key data for different devices. It'd be rubbish for authentication. Second, puffs need to be very reliable. This means that for the same puff, given the same challenge over a period of time, um, the response, the output from the puff should be the same. If this starts to deviate, again, rubbish for things such as key or key generation, key management, and authentication. So then why are puffs useful for us? Um, commonly, puffs are thought of for, in the literature uh, for, as I mentioned before, key derivation or, and key management, and also authentication, so simple challenge and response protocols. They're useful to us where we assume the attack has uh, physical access, um, as uh, non-volatile memory is not usually needed to, to store keys. And given uh, many of the talks that have been, been provided uh, f through this uh, conference, we know that keys sat in non-volatile memories and devices can be pretty uh, insecure and readable. So we try and get around this. Um, and, and this is... Uh, in the case of puffs, we get this through the just in time. We, we can have just in time key data, rather than um, static keys sat in, in a memory. But there's a little bit more. So, 
while we can think of puffs for uh, using puffs for authentication purely or key derivation, it's useful to consider puffs as a, a general uh, entropy resource that we can use for for um, for various things rather than uh, pinpointing the exact use case for them. And with uh, many security applications, uh, different puff designs actually have different strengths, which we can exploit and we aim to exploit uh, in this work. So puffs can be generally categorized into two, um, two key categories. We've got strong puffs and weak puffs. And the terminology is not so clear on this as strong and weak doesn't tend to refer to, or doesn't refer to um, the inherent security properties of the puff, rather the, uh, the challenge response space. So the, the number of possible challenge responses, uh, unique challenge and responses that you can generate from, from a puff. So for strong puffs, Many, we, we can generate many, many possible unique challenge responses. Weak puffs, there's only uh, one to a few um, that we can generate. So then obviously a strength of a strong puff is that it supports many, many unique challenge response pairs. And this tends, we tend to denote this as growing, the CRP space growing exponentially um, as the puff size increases. And generally, not always, but generally, we have a low implementation uh, overhead for many proposed strong puff uh, designs. Uh, many are based on fairly simple um, linear delay uh, uh, logic or, or ring, ring oscillator chains that can be um, uh, cast onto to ASIC or synthesized on FPGA. Uh, the main key weakness of, of strong puffs, however, which is abundant in the literature, is that they're uh, often very vulnerable to machine learning modeling attacks. Machine learning modeling attacks are particular attacks where an adversary may be um, fi through physically uh, assessing the puff or listening over an unsecured channel, collecting these CRPs, collecting a subset of the possible CRPs, and then using this to train some machine learning mo model in order to predict novel CRPs. And you can imagine if an adversary can do this to a high accuracy, then they're able to impersonate the puff and the security is broken. So we have come to some strengths of the weak puffs. In that, while there's uh, often with weak puffs uh, very few, so uh, a linearly uh, growing CRP space with puff size, usually we can generate quite large responses very quickly, um, which can be helpful for, for other purposes. And in general, we assume there's a high security against these machine learning modeling attacks as adversaries have, have uh, can collect few uh, there's less data for an adversary to be able to collect in order to perform a machine learning modeling attack. And there's generally a high complexity in the responses that are output. And then weak puffs come with a few set of weaknesses. Uh, well, a key weakness is, or oh, key weakness, that fewer unique CRPs. So we can't utilize weak puffs for a, a channel response protocol where we would only want to use a CRP one time. Um, you'd run out of CRPs really quickly and you'd have to recall the device. So in this work, we, the hardware implementation, we've um, tried to utilize the strengths of both strong puff and weak puff and not put each in its own box. The way we utilize strong puffs in this work is that we aim to use the, the strong puff for its strength of being able to generate many unique CRPs to generate key bits um, and generate a, a message without requiring uh, the, the stor storage of those key bits in uh, non-volatile memory. And then we use a weak puff. In our case, we, 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 for our proof of concept, we use a DRAM puff. We use the weak puff to serve as sort of a, a reservoir of entropy to support the configuration of some lightweight cryptography. So the motivation then, based on this background, is that the obfuscation techniques, uh, obfuscation techniques so these are techniques and, uh, and, and logic that we can apply outside of the puff can help prevent machine learning modeling attacks by reducing correlative, correlative properties between challenges and responses, but adding all this arbitrary logic skirts around the problem, as, as Ron Mays well mentioned um, on, on Monday, but then why not use puffs to supplement cryptography? Um, why make the assumption that puffs should completely replace cryptography? And then it's important to bridge the requirements of a protocol and then the hardware implications uh, on our threat model, as we assume the adversary has physical access to the device. We design, it's all well and good us designing 
protocols that require um, the, uh, uh, protocols where we assume a key to be safe, because in a non-volatile memory, as I mentioned before, it's not safe. So we should tie in the, the puff obfuscation with, pro with a strong protocol design. And therefore, the, the full application of these, these schemes has, um, has had a limited investigation uh, in the wider literature. Furthermore, usually in, 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 puff, in the, 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 threat, the machine learning modeling attack threat model, we presume that an attacker has either collected some of the CRPs through uh, physically measuring the device or by eavesdropping over a network. But we, as mentioned, there was a, a paper um, brought, brought up by, by a colleague earlier uh, this week in the, in the visionary talk where they mentioned this uh, idea of a semi-honest verifier where a verifier who is, that there could be a, a disgruntled employee or some uh, breach, uh, some breach on the, um, on the verifier side who has elevated privileges, who's then able to perform a modeling attack. What do we do in this scenario? So I'll quickly just describe this scenario uh, in the case of a, uh, a, a smart grid uh, environment where we might have a smart meter factory, they manufacture a device with a puff and provide this to the, um, provide this to the, uh, the, the end user. They'll send an, additional, uh, an initial CRP to a service provider so that they can open up an, a secure authentication channel between the smart device uh, and, and themselves for, for sending energy data, for example. Through multiple rounds of authentication, uh, unique CRPs will be um, sent to the, to the smart home, uh, and, and to and from the, the smart home, and over time, the service provider will log these unique CRPs. This is where the traditional uh, dollar Yao attack model would come into place, where we assume an attacker is listening in on that uh, insecure channel, and they can eavesdrop, they can replay messages, etc. So now in the scenario where we have the, um, the, the end user in the, smart, in, 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 in the home with the smart meter wants to change their service provider. They'll perform the same uh, in, uh, uh, initialization, they'll send initial CRP, CRP to the service provider too, and have a new authentication channel. Now what if we have this, this user with elevated privileges in, in, at service provider one who takes the previously logged channel responses and attempts to model that puff? If they're successful, they're able to compromise this channel. So now onto the proposed scheme uh, we used to try and solve this problem. So first of all, we have our, the, the hardware design. So this is the design of the, the sort of the Puff crypto processor um, uh, for, for uh, obscure for, for utilizing the Puff to generate messages and obscure um, this this channel response interface. So first of all, a counter value which is incremented through the protocol is sent to, uh, as a seed to our pseudo random number generator, where we can generate a challenge for strong puff and a weak puff. In our case, we've used a DRAM puff in our experiments. This means that, uh, our puff memory controller, um, unfortunately I can't go into the detail of how this works, but generates a nice large uh, uh, matrix we can use um, later on for, for, for a, for a one-way function. And this, this um, large matrix with, with good entropy is formed as RM here in the diagram. Then our challenge for our strong puff is supplied and we can collect our message, message bits, our key bits, which is formed as RS. Now, we have a one-way function which is configured by this uh, matrix generated from the, the, the DRAM puff or, or the memory puff, which is essentially a, a lookup table of bits with cryptographic significance um, that uh, uh, enables the, the the one-wayness of, of the one-way function. Again, I wish I could go into a bit more detail of the one-way function, and I'm happy to talk about this after the, the presentation. From this, we have our puff output, which is our final. Now, from some exper from uh, our experiments, we found that using the uh, DRAM puff uh, as to, to generate these this matrix these these um, matrices for the one-way function, we get very strong uniformity in our R final value meaning we can actually use a pseudo-random function as a key derivation function. If the uniformity was relatively poor, we could sort this out with the standard key derivation function. Finally, we derive our key k from the input r final, and then 
we can do some lightweight symmetric uh, encryption with uh, our final as our input message and K as our key to generate delta, which is our final output, which would be used to authenticate uh, the device with the verifier. So now I'm strapped for time and protocol is always horrible to go, go through. So I'll go through this as quick, quickly as possible and point out the important parts of the protocol. We follow a standard path protocol procedure where we have an enrollment phase and an authentication phase. The enrollment phase is what occur, uh, the enrollment phase happens, we assume to happen in a secure environment so the adversary doesn't operate um, during this part of the, of the protocol. The device can send a unique identifier to the verifier and then the verifier can generate a random, a, a random counter, uh, two random counter values and a temporary identifier. And these can be sent to the device. So this is the, uh, how we preserve the privacy. We have a rolling, um, we have a rolling temporary identifier um, which uh, is used by the device. The device never uses the same identifier more than once. So anyone, re anyone listening to, uh, on the uh, eavesdropping the network, reads the TID, uh, they don't know where this has come from. So then we have our puff functionality. So this is just the same procedure as I mentioned in the, pro the, the previous uh, diagram, where we generate in the for, in the for loop uh, multiple bits, and this could be um, uh, n number of bits for however many key bits we, we want to generate and then we generate our final. Importantly, uh, not only is the R final, so the main puff response sent to the verifier, but also the memory puff response sent to the verifier, such that the verifier can also use this to configure his one-way function, so then we can have a shared secret on both sides. We have a secret that's stored in the verifier, which we assume to be secure, and also the device is able to, on the fly, generate this, uh, this secret. So then the authentication happens. And this is assumed to be, um, uh, we're assuming an adversary can operate publicly on this network. So importantly, well, device sends the identifier to say, yep, this is me. And the verifier then uses uh, the, the key for, for this, this uh, individual session, KI, along with um, uh, the, the previously generated counters and a number used once. Uh, to, to, for, for the message verification and generates this verification value res v, which is sent to the device. Device does its puff stuff and then in itself it's able to generate its own verification value res v using the, um, because it, it is in possession of, of uh, the memory puff and the strong puff. It compares the, the verification value that it was sent if, it's, uh, if, they're, if they don't match authentication is aborted. If they do match, the device has authenticated the verifier. The device then runs this puff function again to prepare for the next round of authentication, uh, such that uh, the, the, the new rolling keys can be generated. Importantly, this is where the symmetric encryption occurs and we, uh, the device generates delta, with, and delta is used to authenticate the device on the verifier side. And that's in, uh, passed with the one-way function, we get res res D, which is our verification value. That's sent to the verifier. Verifier does exactly the same. It's able to, to do decryption and get the puff response for the next round and then finish. It'll then store these, uh, store the values for the next round and um, the whole system can start again whenever the device uh, wishes to, to authenticate again. So we implemented this, uh, we implemented this on, on FPJ to determine the hardware overhead. Uh, it's to be noted that this can be quite modular. Um, we, we presume you could use many different uh, lightweight um, cryptographic functions, but we went for uh, our puff. We chose a 32-bit arbiter puff. Um, our PRNG, we use the LSFAR PRNG. Um, our one-way function that, that, that we've developed, um, the Kekak F200 pseudo-random function, sorry, yeah, pseudo random function and a simple Simon block cipher with a message length of 64 bits. And we found that uh, it used uh, 785 lookup tables, 898 um, flip flops, which is a, a relatively low footprint um, given, um, given the, the relative complexity of the uh, implementation. And we implemented this on a Xilinx FPJ. Oh, okay. Uh, so I'll. I'll finish off then. Um, we, yeah, we, we tested against some machine learning uh, attacks, a logistic regression and multi-layer perception attack. 
and this is just predicting the, the binary output of the puff to test if there are any correlative uh, properties. The ideal prediction rate would have been 50% per bit, which is basically a random coin flip, and we found that the, the best we could do is 59%, um, uh, which was attacking the 16-bit um, arbitrary puff with a legitimate regression attack. We consider a pub, uh, for a binary uh, puff with a binary output, you'd have 70% uh, prediction rate for that. So just an, as an overview, where we provide communication privacy, mutual authentication, machine learning uh, resilience, and back back with secrecy, no MVM needed for key storage, and some additional features, scalability, reconfigurability with the, the memory puff, and at, at a reasonable uh, hardware overhead. And the, f the future questions would be to test this um, te the fault injection and side channel attacks on this hardware implementation, uh, as you can imagine. Also, we provided a formal security proof, but uh, too much detail to have in the short talk, and so that's in appendix in the paper. Sorry for going over. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. We um, need to move to the next uh, talk, but uh, if you have a question, please follow up with Owen. Thank you. So I uh, was looking for the speaker of FHE Boost. There we go. So which is actually the, 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 the next, uh, the, the first talk. So Tommy is a PhD student uh, at the University of Delaware. So in fact, he works with a couple of friends, Chemwai and Nectarius. Uh, and he's gonna talk uh, about how he's gonna schedule uh, uh, bootstrapping to uh, boost up performance of fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, hi everyone, yeah, I will be pre uh, presenting FHE Booster today. Um, so here's an outline uh, my presentation. I'm going to start with some background information on homomorphic encryption, and then we can talk about the uh, proposed framework FHE booster. Um, and then I'll show some of our experimental results before giving a conclusion. So we'll start with the background where we're going to talk about uh, homomorphic encryption uh, and noise management. So uh, to think about how homomorphic encryption works, we can think of our standard uh, encryption model where we have some plain text that we send through an encryption algorithm and we'll get some ciphertext out on the other end. At this point, there's usually not too much you can do with these ciphertexts. You can uh, transmit them for secure communications or you can decrypt them later to see what the original plain text values were. Uh, but if we try to do some math operations on them, for example, we might generate some new ciphertext, but under a standard uh, encryption scheme like AES, uh, the resulting uh, plain text is going to be invalid, essentially meaningless, right? Um, but under homomorphic encryption, if we were to do this, we'd essentially get the addition of our original um, operations or uh, plain text. So the main uh, purpose of this technology is to help secure cloud computing. So under our standard model, uh, our local machine, our client's going to have some plain text that they will send over the internet to a server to perform computation on that uh, data. And after they do that, they'll send it back to the client. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, the problem here is that uh, the data is exposed to the server, so um, that's uh, generally okay if you trust the, the cloud company, but in the case of a breach, for example, your data is exposed to those attackers. Um, so what we can do to be more secure is add a layer of homomorphic encryption before sending our data to the server so that the uh, cloud provider only ever sees the homomorphic ciphertext and does the computation on that data before sending it back to the client for decryption. Um, so the, this it is great for security, but there are a few limitations for uh, HE at the moment. Uh, the primary one is that operations take much longer in the encrypted domain than in the unencrypted domain. Uh, but the good news is a lot of people have been working on this. So uh, what this graph shows is that over time, uh, the relative latency of 
homomorphic operations has been uh, decreasing. Uh, first, usually, mostly through algorithmic improvements, uh, but more recently uh, with some hardware acceleration. Uh, so instead, what we decide to focus on um, is the issue of ciphertext noise, which I will explain uh, next. So essentially, the idea is when we encrypt some data under a homomorphic encryption scheme, uh, we're going to have a little bit of random noise in the ciphertext uh, for security purposes. And that's, it's, it's a pretty small amount of noise at first. And we can do some operations like addition, which don't really affect the noise too much. Um, but in comparison, when we do multiplication operations, uh, the noise is going to increase pretty significantly. And the issue with that is that at a certain point, if we have too much noise and we cross some critical threshold, then we can't properly uh, decrypt our ciphertext. We'll get back some invalid uh, plain text. Uh, so that essentially limits the number of operations we can do. Good news is uh, a, new, a, a specific type of homomorphic encryption scheme called Foley homomorphic encryption was introduced. And the main addition here is an operation called bootstrapping, which uh, takes our ciphertext that has a lot of noise in it and reduces it to some lower noise level. And this is essentially going to uh, uh, enable uh, programs of unlimited length because we can do as many operations as we want. Uh, the problem with bootstrapping is that it is very expensive, even compared to uh, our homomorphic operations. Uh, so what our table shows here is that uh, from our profiling data, bootstrapping takes about 27,000 times longer than homomorphic addition. So because of that, it essentially ends up being a significant bottleneck of homomorphic uh, programs. So we started thinking, um, how have people gone about scheduling bootstrapping? And we did find some previous related works that look at the scheduling of uh, operations in the homomorphic domain. Uh, one was Cheetah, which focused on neural networks. Uh, and another was called Alchemy, which uh, does some scheduling to try to limit the uh, noise growth uh, in the program. Uh, the issue with these two works is that they focused on leveled HE, uh, which is a type of uh, HE scheme that does not uh, utilize bootstrapping. Uh, so we really only found one uh, prior work that did some scheduling with bootstrapping. And its method was to essentially just delay as much as it could uh, and do bootstrapping uh, when we get to that critical, th we're right below that critical threshold for noise. Um, so now we can look at kind of a motivating uh, example for our work. Uh, so here we have a task graph with some operations. And we're going to assume that no more than uh, two multiplications can occur between bootstrapping in this example. And if we use that um, T2 compiler approach, uh, what we see is that there's going to be two bootstrapping operations uh, on the highlighted multiplications here. Uh, but we, just through some simple analysis, realized that if we did this optimally, we'd really only ha need to use one bootstrapping operation on this multiplication highlighted in yellow now. Um, so the question we were asking and thinking essentially is, is there some way we can do this optimally, uh, or automatically? So uh, that was the motivation for our FHE booster framework, which I'll talk about in this next part of the um, presentation, focusing on how we model the noise constraints of the uh, FHE programs and how we choose where to do bootstrapping based on that. So here's the overview of our framework. The input is an FHE task graph with no bootstrapping operations on it. And the first step is to generate bootstrap segments. Uh, so we define bootstrap segments as a series of operations in the task graph that have uh, i multiplication uh, operations, where i is an integer uh, that is based on the FHE parameters. And the idea is uh, if along a path you do i multiplications, you're going to be at the uh, noise threshold. And the idea with these segments is if we bootstrap the output uh, ciphertext of any of these operations, we're going to satisfy that segment. And satisfying all the segments uh, means that we never cross that critical noise threshold. 
Um, so we can go back to our uh, example task graph. Again, we're gonna assume no more than two multiplications can occur between bootstrapping operations. And if we analyze the graph, we'll find all the bootstrap segments. So here's one, because it has two multiplication operations on it. Uh, same here. Uh, we have, so yeah, we have these four that all have two multiplication operations, as well as these two. But in this case, we actually ignore these two because they have no dependent operations. They just go straight to the outputs of the program. And if we look at the four that we have left, uh, we can see that they all contain operation three. So that was how earlier we got to uh, that optimal solution of just bootstrapping the uh, operation three. So once we have these segments uh, generated, we can then choose where we should do uh, our bootstrapping in the program. And we developed two methods of doing this. So the first is minimum bootstrapping. And the way you can think of this is as a bipartite graph where we have operations on the left and segments on the right. And whenever we choose an operation to bootstrap, that's gonna satisfy all these segments that it's connected to in the graph. And we wanna choose the minimum number of operations on the left to satisfy all of these segments on the right. Um, and if this seems familiar, that might be because this is equivalent to the set cover problem, uh, which is a classic NP hard problem. So uh, using this method is gonna be limited to, to smaller task graphs essentially. So we uh, decided to also develop a heuristic that we call a score-based heuristic to uh, alternatively choose our bootstrap points. And this flowchart explains how that works. So when we start, we just check if all the uh, segments are, are satisfied, and of course, at the beginning, they won't be. So what we do uh, iteratively is to assign each operation a score. And then uh, whichever operation has the maximum score is gonna be chosen for bootstrapping. And we repeat that process until all of the uh, segments have been satisfied. And at that point, we'll know which ciphertext we're gonna bootstrap. So the question you might have here is, well, how do we assign each operation a score? Um, and we, we tested multiple methods for this. But what we uh, found worked best in the end was to use a simple greedy heuristic for the minimum bootstrapping. Um, so which is essentially just to choose based on the number of unsatisfied segments that a operation is uh, connected to in that bipartite graph. So we re here we've already chosen one uh, operation for bootstrapping, and that means that all of the ones it's connected to are satisfied. So uh, among the remaining operations, we can count how many unsatisfied segments uh, it's connected to. Uh, and since the top one is connected to the most unsatisfied segments, we'll choose that for bootstrapping, and at that point, we have met all of our noise constraints. And so uh, now that we have chosen uh, where to do all of our bootstrapping, we uh, can send that information to our custom scheduler, which we implemented using a simple list scheduling algorithm. And at that point, uh, it's gonna produce an assembly-like schedule that we can then send to our execution engine, which we call FHE Runner, which is simply a C++ program that makes use of the open FHE uh, library, uh, particularly the CKKS uh, FHE scheme. Uh, which, and it's gonna run uh, this multi-threaded schedule and we can verify the results by running the program in both the unencrypted and encrypted domain and then just comparing the results so that we can make sure we're never sat, um, violating any noise constraints. And so we'll use that to run some experiments, uh, and I'll show our results here. So uh, this, this is how we set up our tests. We generated 25 what we call synthetic task graphs, and these are um, essentially randomly generated programs uh, that we generate in a way to be similar to realistic FHE programs. And we also use a real uh, benchmark, which is a logistic regression program. We set up our FHE parameters, so uh, that there are nine multiplications allowed between bootstraps. Uh, I, we have our laptop uh, platform listed here, the hardware, and we generated the schedules to use four threads. So uh, here are the results for these synthetic task graphs. So the average every execution time is on the left, and the number of bootstrap operations is on the right. 
And what we found is that we essentially can half the execution time compared to uh, the T2 compiler's method of just performing uh, bootstrapping as late as possible. And we can see that that's correlated to um, a reduction in the number of bootstrap operations. And what we found is that our greedy heuristic gets very close to matching the optimal minimum bootstrapping. Um, and the good news is when we uh, tested this with our logistic regression program, we essentially see the same results, where again, um, our methods uh, reduce the number of bootstrapping, which improves uh, performance. And we can also see here that um, the minimum bootstrapping and the greedy heuristic uh, ended up doing the same number of bootstrap operations, but they chose slightly different sets of ciphertext to bootstrap, and so they do have some slightly different uh, execution times. Um, with that, I will uh, just list some of the key takeaways of uh, my presentation. So the first thing is that FHE has great potential, uh, but currently it is held back by performance because uh, performing these encrypted operations uh, takes a lot longer than uh, performing the same operations on unencrypted data. In particular, bootstrapping uh, is a very expensive operation, so it ends up being the, the current bottleneck. Um, and so that's what we decided to target with FHE Booster, um, which improves performance at an application level by reducing the number of bootstrapping operations. And our results showed that uh, there's a significant improvement in performance uh, due to that reduction. So that's all I have. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Thank you. Um, we have a time for, uh, for one question, if there is. There is not, I, I have a question. Uh, uh, Jim, please, go ahead. So how long does a bootstrap operation take? H how long does it take? Yeah, how, how, many, how many cycles, yeah. Um, we, uh, yeah, so the way that we would measure it is actually in seconds because it takes a long time. Um, it, it, of course, it depends on what hardware you're using. Um, so I don't have a, an exact number. I want to say on our test platform, it probably took about a second and a half, maybe two seconds to okay. perform bootstrapping. Yeah. So, um, so you say significantly improve. So what, do you, what are you talking about? 50%, uh, 25% uh, improvement by reducing the number of bootstraps? I mean, what's the fraction? So uh, yeah, if we look at the results here, um, basically uh, when we were averaged out the execution time on our 25 test graphs here, uh, we were seeing almost a have like almost a two times speed up. Um, I'm, I think the number is actually closer to like 1.9 or something like that. Um, yeah. Okay, is this just for the bootstrap or is this for the full for the, FHE? Uh, right, so this is for the whole execution time of the programs that we were testing. So when we average them all out using the as late as possible uh, okay. method, you see it takes 82.9 seconds on average, whereas with the minimum bootstrapping set, uh, it only takes 42.2 okay. seconds. Thank you. So I, I, maybe I will follow up with, uh, with Gen Y and things like that. But these results that you have here are typically applicable also to, to CGGI or, uh, or other methods because you know, you're looking at the structure of the graph um, in things. Now, uh, the parameters that you choose, this is for a single set of parameters, uh, right? Because you only have uh, nine levels. Right. Uh, so you have, um, basically, your, your, uh, your moduli chain is nine. Uh, nine to ten, um, so it, it would be kind of interesting to have a more uh, kind of comprehensive um, uh, kind of experimentation. But uh, uh, given that you are basically halving the number, not quite halving the number of bootstrapping, mm -hmm. I, I would have expected a little bit more uh, uh, reduction in uh, execution time because the bootstrapping is expensive. But you are, uh, but it takes also 75 to 90 percent of the execution of a typical homomorphic encryption program. So speed up should should be a little bit uh, larger. I think uh, because you are using a quad core, uh, you are getting into some communication problem that is capping your uh, your speed up. If you repeat the experiment on a sim on a single core, you should see a larger uh, variation. Just just a comment. Okay. 
okay? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So let's move to the next uh, um, uh, talk. Minfei, do you want to, to, to come? Thank you. It's great to work. Uh -huh. Ah, yes, yes. So you're from Synapsis, huh? Ah, there we go. So let me explain this situation because I was involved. So this is a, a, a work, um, a joint work with the EPFL, um, um, uh, Nani De Micheli and uh, Minfei, you? Um, um, Minfei, you? And uh, Synapsis. So the Minfei had uh, a problem with the visa. Okay, he couldn't be here with us. And... Um, And we are having technical problems. Steven Zemiko. Okay. So this was an, an interesting talk to come after uh, uh, the homomorphic encryption because they, they are talking about the uh, garbling. Okay, so the author of uh, VPP uh, is uh, you. Come on in. There you go. So uh, oh, very good. So you are a, a student at George Mason University. Come on in. So please uh, um, uh, join me to welcome our uh, speaker. Uh, the talk is 15 minutes plus five minutes question and answer, okay? I will be very, I uh, will be merciless on that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, <coughs> hello everyone, welcome to my uh, presentation. I'm Shahidul from George Mason University. It's a collaboration work with uh, Queen's University Belfast. Uh, in the UK, uh, yeah, my uh, work uh, is basically a defense against a privacy attack on machine learning model uh, via undervolting. Um, machine learning model uh, is widely used uh, uh, on uh, privacy sensitive data sets, for example, uh, clinical or biomedical records <laughs> genomic data, uh, locational trace, uh, also financial records. So uh, machine learning actually uh, is vulnerable to uh, many privacy issues. Uh, for example, property inference attack uh, that try to uh, infer some global properties of the data set, um, model inversion attacks uh, that uh, try to uh, reconstruct the training data uh, from the output of the model and uh, malicious training uh, that, for example, uh, ML providers can be suspected uh, uh, to control the training uh, algorithm so that the model uh, memorize some sensitive data. Also, membership inference attack, uh, who is try to in far whether a particular sample has been used to train the model. And we uh, build our defense against membership inference attack in this work. Uh, so what is membership inference attack? Um, it's just uh, asking us these particular questions, whether a particular model has been trained uh, on a particular sample, for example, CAT. Uh, just to review the training, Procedure, we are like given uh, a training uh, data set. So we do some optimization algorithm uh, to build a model. Uh, and uh, membership inference uh, for this question. So for example, we are given a image, a cat, 
we just uh, ask the question whether it is in the training set or not. Why? Why do we need to ask this question? It can be out of curiosity. For example, I just wanted to know if my data has been used to train the model. Or to question reconnaissance, for example, if I know that a particular model is trained on this particular data, so it will, I could uh, uh, like more attack the model more sophisticatedly. Uh, or uh, membership inference attack has been used for uh, data extraction. That's a building block of data extraction attack. Uh, also for auditing, for example, I uh, develop a privacy attack, so how sophisticated is my attack, so that um, for this purpose we need to perform this membership inference attack. So there are lots of defense uh, on against membership inference attack so far. Uh, based on differential privacy, for example, DPHDD or PET, and uh, it uh, has some limitations of uh, like lower accuracy. Also, some regularization-based defense, for example, adversary regularization, level smoothing or dropping. Again, it has some limitations of this uh, lower accuracy. Also, some output uh, output obfuscation-based defense, for example, MEMGUARD. Uh, it has, uh, like, it maintains the utility but lowers the privacy. Um, and some distillation-based defense, um, for example, DMP or Selena, these are the recent differences. Uh, so it has, uh, the sh like, cause, it, it, it suffers from higher computational cost because of using multiple models. So, uh, we ask, like, our work is based, based on this, asking these simple questions. So can we design defense that can overcome these limitations? So for this, uh, we propose VPP, which is actually um, privacy preserving voltage, um, uh, which is basically a randomness-based defense that can maintain uh, utility as well as uh, ensuring the privacy. So. Uh, BPP uh, is basically introduces stochastic noise to the model uh, at inference time. So, uh, for example, um, uh, in the like we uh, introduce additive Gaussian noise to the deep learning models. So the noise parameters, for example, the uh, like magnitude of the noise and how deep in the model we are going to inject noise. Uh, so that is uh, like these parameters, uh, we s find these parameters by some space exploration method. Um, with two things in mind, we need to keep higher accuracy, also preserve the like privacy, higher privacy. So that's a multi-objective uh, problem. Optimization problem. So our defense um, is able to provide uh, like higher higher utility or the classification accuracy, also higher privacy, and uh, we uh, do so by means of undervolting, which means we have some byproduct energy savings. So uh, we. Um, um, demonstrate one harder implementation using uh, Jailing um, uh, like FPGA, that is a zinc uh, ultra scale FPGA. So we um, basically undervolt the compute unit, computation unit only. And um, basically, we have software and harder implementation, and this figure um, shows that. Uh, by means of hardware, we can achieve the similar level of implementation as software. Just start. Yeah, grass.
Okay, no worries. We'll uh, we'll continue from where we we left. Okay. Oh wow. Okay. One second, one second, one second. We'll I think continue from first. Um, so we are here. Still probably the same problem. So yeah, yeah. It does not proceed, I think. Somehow it blocks this on this slide. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we are being attacked. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. So now uh, we finished the experimental uh, set of things. Now let's look at the result. Uh, so here um, we see the effect of our defense on uh, attack uh, feature. So uh, looking at the baseline model, uh, which has the distribution of attack feature on train data and test data. So the attack is basically asking whether a particular sample belongs to the uh, training data. So looking at the distribution, it is clear that the two distributions are separable uh, with little overlap. That means, uh, in general, uh, for baseline model, uh, it is possible to infer uh, accurately that a particular sample has been used in the model or not. But for the protected model with our defense, we can see that the distribution has overlap, meaning uh, confusion. So the attackers will be confused whether a particular sample is really used or not. And looking, um, looking at the um, uh, uh, like confidence vector, uh, like the top 10 uh, confidence uh, values of the confidence vector, for three different models, uh, we can see that the that, that, that top one, um, the distribution of top one uh, probability uh, is like, uh, has li little overlap, the green one, the green overlap. So, but the other uh, like um, top one, top two, top three, uh, until top nine, so they have like overall um, like overlaps between them, so it means the, uh, the accuracy uh, 
like the, for the protected model that we can achieve like, uh, so the, the lower green overlap, that is very uh, lower, it means we lose uh, very few accuracy, uh, but uh, overlap the, uh, in, in the other uh, like probabilities, it, the higher overlap meanings, uh, the attacker will be mass confused. Uh, so the accuracy of the attack will, will goes down. So um, uh, this is uh, like a comparison of the differences in terms of uh, attacks. So um, before looking at the table, uh, so the, the table actually uh, shows the uh, privacy risk uh, by means of a membership uh, inference attack accuracy metrics. So the way we can interpret this table is um, it's basically Having 50% uh, of the accuracy here in the table is the ideal case from defense perspective, uh, which means that um, like, like a particular sample, is like 50% chance that a particular sample is used in the training case, training set, and the 50% time um, it has not been used. So it's like, because it's basically two, like two class uh, classifier, so that means uh, l looking at our defense, so we are like close to 50%. Uh, so from the privacy perspectives, uh, it shows promising result. Um, so this is yet another comp uh, like uh, comparison, uh, like looking at our the, the performance of our defense for the level only attack. So we took the levels of the classifier only by means of attack, like for the privacy attack. So um, for the unprotected model, the distribution again is separable, meaning um, uh, it is possible um, like to infer whether a sample is used uh, just looking at the level. But for the like protected models, the distribution has a greater overlap, meaning confusion again. So that helps a lot. So here, um, after the privacy comparison, it is also important to preserve the accuracy of the model. Uh, so this uh, actually result shows uh, the comparison in terms of accuracy. Uh, it means the higher the better. Uh, so uh, the green one is ours, uh, comparing with the red red uh, bar, which is the baseline accuracy. Well, so uh, we are losing very negligible accuracy in terms of the baseline, but with the other difference, so we are comparable or slightly higher. Here is the comparison of differences, uh, both in terms of privacy and utility or the accuracy. Uh, so the at, uh, like bottom right, uh, like this corner is the target, the ideal case. So looking at the like green circle, like we are again, comparable or a little bit outperforming uh, with the base defense like um, and we demonstrate one way of uh, adaptive attack uh, which means let's assume the attackers knows the knows our defense techniques and they exploit the insight of our uh, like defense assuming assuming these uh, how much the attacker can adapt their algorithm uh, to beat ourselves, to defeat ourselves. So one way is of our defense, the insight of our defense is to obfuscate the attack feature. So we, we, we introduce random noise uh, in the model to garble uh, the attack features. So the attackers do not have access to the exact values of the attack features. Uh, but uh, we like randomize the attack features. That means if attackers uh, can uh, make multiple inference of the model, then they will have access to multiple attack vectors or attack features, and they can maybe uh, compute the mean of the distributions, and that can approximate, uh, or, the, or yeah, that can approximate to the to the actual mean of the actual distribution. So that's how the x-axis is the number of queries, the how many times they collect the attack features. So looking here, um, it helps a little bit 
uh, that increases the privacy risk. But again, uh, looking at the bottom figure, the execution time is very high. Mm -hmm. So meaning um, the attacker have hard time to beat the defense. Uh, yeah, just to summarize, uh, we actually propose a BPP, uh, a privacy preserving default test uh, that's light it and uh, effective. So we actually introduce noise uh, during inference time um, by means of undervolting. Uh, so um, it, it does not require a retraining of the model. Uh, it, it preserves the privacy while maintaining the utility. Uh, and uh, because of using undervolting, we uh, have some byproduct energy savings. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, any questions? Okay, thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Uh, in the meantime, we'll, uh, we try the, 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 to load the, the slide. Um, uh, so any questions? Because if there are no questions, I actually have two. Well, I have quite a few. Um, um, but uh, so, so the, the, this has something to do with the, with the, with the differential privacy, even though you are uh, in introducing the noise by undervolting uh, into the attack. But on, uh, on the evaluation, right, you only look at the separation of mean which is the first order of basically statistics that you can look at. It's basically a t-test. Um, are you, did you look at the higher order, like covariance and uh, other things, if there is a residual uh, leakage that can still make the membership attack to work? Oh, that's an interesting question. Oh, my uh, well, people don't look into these things, but. I it, but I, I really look into it in my future work. Yeah, it might be an extra step, uh, because that, that, that might well be an extra step. Uh, the other part of it is, um, you know, the, how does it relate to differential privacy, the undervolting? Because differential privacy has a very well def defi uh, defined model that allow you to uh, bound the amount of privacy that you have versus utility, which is what you were showing here. Uh, but I'm not sure that undervolting exactly give you um, all the properties of well-defined distributions. So I don't know. So the differential privacy actually like um, stochastically um, uh, garbles the gradient of the model, but we uh, stochastically uh, like uh, garbles the computation of the model, uh, especially after the activation, uh, after its act activation layer. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, uh, there is a similarity with differential privacy, mm -hmm. but yet we have some <laughs> difference. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Okay, let's thank our speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, and last but not least, so we are going, I promise you, we are going to make this presentation. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> Dr. Uh, Iteng Zhang from Synaptis. Uh, the work that is going to present is joint work with uh, um, uh, Nani and uh, Minfei uh, Yu from uh, EPFL. Uh, and, uh, you know, unlike the previous talk that was on homomorphic encryption, this is on garbled circuits. So another form of uh, uh, cryptographic tools for processing encrypted data. Okay, so it's my pleasure, it's, it's my pleasure to uh, present on behalf of my friend Minfei Yu and Demi Kelly. Uh, this is generating lower cost garbled circuit logic synthesis can help. Here is the outline of this presentation. We first briefly introduce the garbled circuit protocol as well as existing effort on making this protocol more practical. Then we will talk about our proposal of taking multi-phase logic gates into the scope of low cost garbled circuit generation and evaluation of our proposal is reported also. Secure mark Secure multi-party computation known as MPC enables several parties to jointly conduct computation using their private input without revealing privacy. The global circuit protocol, GC, is believed to be the promising way to realize MPC and is the cornerstone of many modern MPC protocols. 
GC is first proposed by Yao as a solution to two-party computation. In this problem, they are two parties, Alice and Bob. They are wondering who is richer without letting each other know the amount of money they have. For clarity, let us assume the amount to be merely one bit. Then, the result can be easily learned by simulating the one-bit comparator circuit using inputs from the two parties. However, in this way, privacy cannot be preserved because no matter which party takes responsibility of conducting the simulation, he or she has to know the input from the other party. To address this problem, Andrew Yao first proposed the idea of garbling the Boolean circuit in this protocol, the target computation is represented as a Boolean circuit, and the two parties respectively place the rules of the gobbler who generates the gobbled circuit from the Boolean circuit and executor who evaluates the gobbled circuit. Here is an analogy between a Boolean circuit and its corresponding gobbled circuit. The one-bit comparator we have seen before is adopted as an example. Based on this Boolean circuit for each wire, Alice creates a pair of two labels with denote wires using capitalized letter. For example, here is the truth table of this gate in red. We can correspondingly create a lookout table using labels on wire A, the two potential labels A0 and A1 respectively corresponding to, correspond to signal A is zero and signal A is one. But these labels are essentially bit string and don't have semantic meanings, which means Bob cannot learn from the labels at his hand whether the corresponding signal is zero or one. For each entry of the loop, Lookup table, Alice uses the two input labels to encrypt the output of label. In this way, an encrypt table is created. By creating encrypt tables for all logic gates in the Boolean circuit, Alice generates a garbled circuit, which is then sent to Bob for evaluation. This corresponds to an excessive amount of data communication which has become the bottleneck of realizing large scale, low latency and energy efficient MPC. For example, secure neural network inference is an emerging application scenario of MPC. According to a relevant publication in 2019, garbling a merely three layer neural network can already result in 128 megabyte data communication. Hereafter, we term this communication cost as garbling cost. Recall the five steps in the GC protocol. The data communication happens in the GC transmission step. Thus, the two previous steps respect, respectively correspond to two technical directions. First, to reduce the number of gates in the Boolean circuit, and second, to improve the protocol itself in order to reduce the garble, garbling cost per garbled gate. We are interested in those works done on logic synthesis side, but it is remarkable that in 2008, researchers working on protocols noticed that due to the spatial property of XOR operation, a garbled XOR can be free by creating labels in a specific way. This fact connects the problem of reducing gobbling costs to a well-known logic synthesis problem, the multiplicative complexity, MC reduction problem. In logic synthesis, a Boolean circuit is typically abstracted into a logic network for <coughs> compact representation such as X or N grab, also called XAG. After implementing a function as XAG or say over to, in, to input N, 
to input XOR of an inverter, then the MC of this graph is the number of N gates in it. Given the function, its XAG representation is not unique. Take the three input majority as an example whose truth table is shown here. It output true, it output truths if more than half of its input signal are true. There is such a XAG implementation for majority three whose MC is three. But there, there, there also exists a XAG implementation using only one end gate. Given the function, the MC reduction problem asks how to find a XAG implementation using as few to input end gate as possible. To solve this problem, the most straightforward idea is to exploit existing logic optimization techniques in a hybrid way. In recent work, researchers make use of the fact that N2 and XOR, XNOR2 are distinguishable only if the two input pattern is zero, zero. For example, in this Boolean circuit, it is noticed that the input pattern of N4 is zero, zero, only if the primary input of A, B, C are respectively zero, one, one. Sorry, uh, here should be one. This primary input of C should be one. Uh, however, under this input condition, the output of the gate N, N3 would be zero and dominate the primary output D, making the output of N4 unobservable. Therefore, we can replace N4 with a XNOR gate and reduce the NC by one without changing the functionality of this circuit. Despite of these remarkable works, uh, the NC reduction problem is generally regarded to be intractable. To go a step further, we argue that NC reduction is not the only way to lower cost GCs. For the first time, we propose to bring symmetric multi-phase logic gates into the scope. When synthesized Boolean circuit to be garbled, logic gates with a phase size larger than two are hardly taken into consideration because the garbling cost per gate increase um, exponentially if the phase size increase uh, for the same reason. To input N is the only logic primitive we use to express the MC of target computation. Thanks to uh, intensive research on improving the protocol, its cost is eventually reduced to two. But this is not the end of the story. Researchers uh, later propose a technique called a uh, gobbling gadget to efficiently gar garble symmetric logic gates. Symmetric logic gates refers to uh, those gates whose output depends on the hamming weight of the input pattern, or say uh, the number of ones in an input pattern. The majority three we have seen before is exactly a three input symmetric logic gate. Gobbling gadget realized uh, this by realizing free XOR. XOR is a modulo two addition. Similarly, we can interpret uh, the operation of other symmetric logic gate as modulo addition, followed by a projector to return back to the uh, binary domain. For example, a gobbling of three input end gate previously requires an eight entry encrypt table. By con in contrast, since there are four potential hamming weights of the input pattern from zero to three, it can be garbled into a modulo four addition followed by a four to two projection which needs only four entry of encrypt table. Then we can update our table of garbling costs per logic gate, um, interpreting an, an input symmetric logic operation as a modulo addition. The modulus is at most n, therefore their gobbling costs are reduced from two to the power of n to uh, no more than n. This observation indicates that symmetric gates can be efficiently garbled. Thus, we start wondering when building the, uh, when building the Boolean circuit to generate GC, is there other logic primitive that can express 
they can e express NZ more cost efficiently than two input ends um, to quantify the garbling cost efficiently uh, of a logic gate. Uh, we propose a definition called NZ compactness. Numerically, it is the NZ of a logic logic gate divided by its garbling cost. Thus, a more MC compact gate can possibly provide MC more garbling cost efficiently. We calculate the MC and garbling cost of all five symmetric three input logic gates. Uh, three input XOR is not included in this table because its MC is zero. As for the last two types of gates, one hot, output one, uh, if only one of its three inputs is one. Gamble output one when the three inputs are O0 or O ones. Um, for three input get zero, zero, zero is the only one input pattern whose hemming weight is zero. And one, one, one is the only input pattern whose hemming weight is three. The, go the gobbling cost of one hot and gamble are lower than M3 and majority three because they feature that their outputs are the same under this input pattern. Um, deter, uh, determine that the modulo required to interpret these two operations as modulo addition are smaller than the case of M3 and majority three. From the table, we noticed that M3 is more MC compact than the best line to input N. For example, um, when the target computation to be garbled is a three input N operation, then adopting N3 over N2 can reduce the gobbling cost from four to three. With simple generalization, it is fully noticed wider N are more, uh, wider N are more cost efficient. MC provider, uh, we can easily make use of this observation. Given a XAG implementation, we can reduce its gobbling cost by detecting uh, consecutive ends in it and merging them into multi fan in and not. This observation inspired us to come up with a merging algorithm. Okay, so um, we can find groups of adjacent end nodes in a XAG and each node are partition, uh, we, we call the starting point as root and the ending point of the cut as leaves. And we propose an algorithm to um, optimally decide the cut frontier such that uh, to achieve the best overall uh, end merge. And we also consider different situations, such as if the H has a inverter there, then it auto automatically becomes the cut frontier. And if it's multiple E, if it has multiple fan now, then it also uh, serves as a root of this new uh, and merge. So uh, another insight is that uh, we can interpret a, we can interpret a two input end gate using one hot gate to reduce the gobbling cost because a uh, we can rewrite the we can write a functional equivalent uh, representation in this form. So uh, due to time limitation, we here to report we we here report the evalu evalu evaluation result over the EPFL combinational circuit suit. Um, in this benchmark suite, uh, it contains arithmetic and random control circuit. Uh, we observe that uh, consistent with our expectation, our two proposal of merging the algorithm and X1G, that is uh, use X or N, one hot gate optimization, um, they always generate a better, better result in terms of gobbling cost, as we see in the job geometric mean of the improvement, this row. 
And we also noted that the result, of the result highly depends on benchmark property. On random control circuit, uh, more considerable improvement over the state of the art are also achieved. Uh, to summarize the presentation, uh, to solve the problem of reducing gobbling cost, contributions of logic synthesis community focus on the step of representing the target function as a Boolean circuit. More specifically, um, the function are implemented over two input X or two input N, an inverter. Previously, research focused on reducing the number of two input N in XAG. However, it is noted that symmetric logic gate can be garbled much more efficiently than we thought, which inspires us to think about adopting other more gobbling cost efficient logic primitives. Uh, we met two proposals. One, to use wider end and to use one hot gate. Um, we respectively developed algorithm to support our ideas and manage to make improvement over the state of the art. Uh, thank you for your attention. Any question and comments are highly welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, by the way, just to side the note, Andrew Yao received the Turing Award two years ago, okay? So now it's not a random person that does a garbled circuits. Uh, uh, so the um, uh, qu um, questions. Okay. If there are no questions, I do, I do have a couple of uh, things. This is, this is actually pretty cool uh, because, you know, after uh, Frixor, Offgate, and, and all this, you know, thinking basically to use multi-input and, uh, and other things, it's actually novel uh, in, um, in many ways. So how big of a benchmark have you been uh, trying with, with this technique? You mean, uh, oh, could you repeat again? Yeah, yeah, so uh, wh uh, what benchmarking have you been doing? So did you try with uh, the millionaire problem, uh, um, a 32-bit multiplier, uh, the, the typical benchmarks that people use with the garbled circuits? Okay, mm -hmm. uh, I think in so far in this work, they focus, they evaluated on arithmetic circuit and as, mm -hmm. as they mentioned, random and control, random control or control, random circuit or control circuit, and I think in my at least in my opinion, our, our arithmetic cir circuit is quite uh, re representative because such as in neural networks, some, sometimes we, we want to hide the weight we trend. So, and in neural network, they are a lot of arithmetic unit. Mm -hmm. So I think they did, did a correct job that they evaluate it using arithmetic circuit mm -hmm. here. Oh, right, right. All right. Um, any yeah. any other questions uh, from the any other questions from the audience? Okay. Well, uh, let's thank our speaker. And uh, thank you. Very happy that we. Met.